Across the Fence, we'll explore the noteworthy collections and the remarkable family history of the Kent DeLord House Museum. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. The Kent DeLord House Museum is an icon in Plattsburgh, New York. The house is filled not only with treasured collections from three generations of the DeLord family, it also boasts a number of fascinating historical stories. To find out more, I'm joined by the director of the Kent DeLord House Museum, Don Wickman. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Well, good afternoon, Judy. Always fun to be here. Yeah, now one of the key stories behind the Kent DeLord House Museum is something you call untangling the webs. It's about a um, how the a collection of material from Connecticut of the Webb family, which is well established in the in that state, came up to the museum, the Kent Delord House Museum in Plattsburgh. I mean, there's a good distance there, right? And you're like, how does something come from Connecticut? all the way up to Plattsburgh. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to, um, during the program, provide a sampling of some of those items. And as a little bit more of a surprise is, there's a Vermont, Vermont link to this story also. All right, where does it all begin? Okay, uh, 1626 actually, <laughs> uh, Richard Webb is settles, uh, comes across from England and settles in Boston, uh, but then he's, he moves on. There's more some religious region, uh, reasons why he goes to Hartford, Connecticut, mm -hmm. and then subsequent uh, descendants end up, as you can see, down in Stamford, Norwalk, and then eventually end up in the town of Wethersfield, which is just south of Hartford. Hmm. But um, the Webbs first made their mark in Connecticut. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. We have to acknowledge Richard Webb is one of the first settlers of Hartford. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. With Thomas Hooker, who was the leader of the disgruntled Puritans that <laughs> went over there. Um, and others, his sons and uh, grandsons became successful merchants and millers. And one of the one interesting things that I discovered that uh, his great grandson was the youngest founder of Yale University. Really? Yeah. And it's like, wow, that's pretty remarkable. And one thing that's very confusing about the family is that there's loads of Josephs <laughs> in the family. And they went from Joseph one, two, three, and then they all of a sudden would go back to Joseph Jr. again. And um, the, the Joseph that's portrayed here up on the screen, we don't have an image of him. He's the one responsible for building the house in Wethersfield, Connecticut mm -hmm. in 1752. And that house uh, is now part of a complex called the Webb Dean Stevens House. And it uh, still complex. stands today. It still stands today. And he married a wonderful lady by the name of Mehetable Knot. What? <laughs> right. Mehetable and, Knot? Uh, what a Mehetable. name. Yes, yes. And um, it always attracts a lot of attention when tourists come through. And, and there she it's is. a wonderful portrait of her done in around 1860. And so what happened then? Okay. Um, Afterwards is their oldest son, Joseph Jr., another Joseph, mm -hmm. um, married Abigail Clark, uh, Chester, sorry, in 1774. Now, his portrait there is actually a pastel done by well-known early American portraitist John Singleton Copley, mm -hmm. uh, which is a name many people might recognize. And they, as I said, married in 1774, and he assumed living in the family homestead. But what was really neat about there is one of the most cherished artifacts that we have there is the wedding fan that was carried by Abigail. How unusual. Right. And look at, look at the monogram. That is carved out of ivory. It came from Japan, courtesy of one of Abigail's uncles. Wow, that must have been, uh, for the day, quite an extravagant gift. Exactly, exactly. And the way it unfolds is that they put it all together so uh, then you can see the whole monogram. It's, it's a wonderful piece of work and you start really uh, realizing that, that that's 1774 that they were trading with Japan. Incredible. And so now we move on to the American Revolution. Right. Uh, what happened during the Revolution was uh, Joseph Jr and um, all his brothers greatly supported the American cause. Uh, he suffered eventually for that, and I'll get into that. Um, but he actually hosted General George Washington at the house. Wow. Um, and here he is pictured on the right. And he met in May of 1781 with French General Rochambeau, and they planned out the 1781 campaign 
at Yorktown. And today, if you go to the Webb House in Wethersfield, they've recreated the Washington bedroom and the original wallpaper is still there. Some so portions. George Washington slept there. Literally for about four <laughs> days. Uh, unfortunately, is because uh, Joseph so strongly supported the war, he also took a risk of assuming the very um, undervalued um, continental dollar for full value, and he suffered and was thrown into the debtor's prison. Oh, wow. For 12 to 15 years, and he ended up losing their house. Well, that's a sad ending for such a patriotic person. It is, it is. What about Joseph and Abigail? Did they have children? Oh, many children. <laughs> okay. Uh, they had 12, 10, wow. uh, 10 uh, survived into adulthood. Uh, so he wasn't in prison all the time right. um, during that time. And we can brag about having portraits of six of those children. That folks can see. Yes, yes. Um, and there's a, it's a very handsome family when you start seeing that. Uh, we have Charles, Joseph, John, Eliza, and Thomas. So only five there, but you said that they had six of the portraits? Oh, well, I'm just tempting you there because that's part <laughs> of the, I'm not really forgetting number six, but that's the other part of the story. Okay. Is that Henry Livingston Webb, who's here on the right, uh, was a very successful merchant and he met a young Frances Henrietta Delord in Albany when she was only 18. Mm -hmm. Well, they fell in love. They married, even though there was a 15 year difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and they actually were the second wedding that occurred at the Delord house um, in 1832 in the gold parlor, which still exists. And um, they had a daughter, another Francis. This is like the Josephs. <laughs> and unfortunately she died a, a month later of complications of childbirth at the age of 20. So the mother died. The mother died. That's so sad. But um, so what happened to the family after that? Well, what happened is that Henry didn't feel like he was qualified to raise a young daughter. So he first had um, Betsy Delord Swetland, um, the girl's granddaughter, mm -hmm. uh, grandmother, take uh, and look after her. But he wasn't pleased with her child rearing skills. Oh, really? <laughs> really. And it's, it's all you can read about it in some of the letters that are in the collections at SUNY Plattsburgh. And um, he ended up having his oldest sister, Eliza, look after the child until she was 21. But Henry never remarried. Uh, he was devastated. He had a mourning portrait done of his young wife, which is also in the house collection. And um, so Eliza looked after uh, her at the time. But another item, and you can see a picture of as we, uh, she was later called Fanny <laughs> to try to um, correct all these Francis's out there. But one item that we have also that we just discovered this year, at least to my knowledge, on the bookshelf is the day before Henry Livingston Wood died in um, 1846, he and his daughter were walking the streets in Hartford, Connecticut, and they purchased a book called The Rose of Sharon. And he signed that, and you can see there from her beloved and I think, um, respected father or something. I'm paraphrasing mm -hmm. there a little bit, but he actually dated it the day before he died, probably of a stroke or a coronary. Died suddenly, obviously not expected. Yeah, to. It, exactly. It was it was great surprise. She was not there for for that, but later described to her grandmother the whole instances of the death. And so this book has been sitting in the library of the museum. And tell me how you came upon it. Uh, it the room that it was in was rather cluttered and uh, some of the shelves were blocked and I had a volunteer that when I was telling him about the book title that I saw in this letter that um, Frances wrote to her grandmother, he said, I think I've seen that book title. Really? Right, and then we, we found it and we looked and there was the inscription. Incredible. Yep, and it's, it's wonderful what you can discover at odd times. Yeah, well now, now I need to know what happened to Frances. Okay, well, <laughs> Frances, until um, she reached 21, was being cared of Eliza, but then she met a young Presbyterian minister by the name of Frank Hall. And they married in 1856 and lived briefly in Connecticut, then Lake Luzerne. And in the 1860s, after he served two, uh, nearly two years as a chaplain in the Civil War, moved to the Delord family homestead in Plattsburgh. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened was that Frank was the executor for the two last surviving Webb children, Emily, uh, Amelia 
and Eliza. Mm -hmm. And by being the executor, and France is being the oldest, well, the only daughter of a male heir, ended up with many of the items, family items. Interesting. And so that's how the web collection reached it. Plattsburgh? Yes, it must have been really interesting packing, um, <laughs> I can bringing only all of the, right, bringing all of this from Hartford. You would have uh, probably been able to do rail until Whitehall, yep. and then you would have had to put it on a steamboat to bring it up to Plattsburgh. Interesting. Right, some good packing at that time for sure. Yeah. So, what are some of the items now on display? Okay. Well, this year we've dedicated almost one whole room at the Kent the Lord House for just the web collection. But a few of the items, there's a couple of things that are too big mm -hmm. uh, to move, and I didn't even want to venture forth. Like that large portrait of Mehetable Knot is right next to the room. <laughs> Mehetable stays where she is. Uh, but there is a large grandfather's clock on display that's attributed to the webs. Um, we have Henry Livingston's web library of over 200 volumes. Wow. Uh, a wonderful drawing done by American portraitist um, Henry Inman of a mythical created character by a satirist of Maine called Major Jack Dowling. He was telling what was going on in the Jacksonian White House um, through this mythical character. Uh, there's web and uh, silver on display. We have Eliza Webb's deed box, uh, furniture, and of course, all those portraits. Yeah, and you said over 200 books. Yes, yes, he was extremely well, re uh, well read. And um, some of the titles vary from, uh, we have here, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, mm -hmm. uh, Rob Roy, which people have heard of before, um, Shakespeare, you loved it. The classics. Uh, yes, uh, the, right, when they, before they were classics in some <laughs> case. Uh, the Last Days of Pompeii. But also we have found on the shelf, we have uh, examples of Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. and also James Fenimore Cooper. And a little sidelight was when Francis and Henry Livingston Webb honeymooned in Europe for almost two years. Nice. Must be nice, yeah. nice. Um, they got to meet James Fenimore Cooper in France and, and dine with him. Wow, that's right. incredible. Yes. What stories, but the Webb story doesn't end there. No, no, I got to tempt you a little bit here, <laughs> is that uh, one of the interesting parts is that um, there's an, a Vermont link here, mm -hmm. and, uh, which will good to uh, at least draw the interest of the Vermont viewers here, is that uh, Joseph Jr. had a younger brother, Samuel Blatchley Webb. He fought during the American Revolution, and apparently it's through family history that he might be linked to um, having Washington come and stay at the Webb House in Wethersfield in mm -hmm. 1781. Well, he eventually moved to New York. He had a, a, a son, James Watson Webb, and his son was a William Seward Webb. And it's interesting, first of all, I didn't know where the William Seward came from, but uh, in the 1840s, James Watson Webb was convicted of illegal dueling. Hmm. And after serving in prison for two, year, uh, two months, the governor of New York, William Seward, pardoned him. And he was so gratified, he named one of his following sons after him. No kidding. Right. And if the name William Seward Webb sounds familiar, it's because he and his wife, Lila Vanderbilt, uh, created Shelburne Farms. So that's how the families are related. Right. And then what gets a little more is, of course, his daughter-in-law, Electra Havermeyer Webb, created the Shelburne Museum. That's incredible. We have a couple of minutes left. Um, I also want to talk about another event that's happening. The P Battle of Plattsburgh is coming up. Yes. People yes. should put that on their calendar. Right, right. Um, September 10th through 13th. It's going to be a little scaled down because it's the 201st year this year. <laughs> uh, but again, at the if you come to the Kent Lord House for that weekend, we'll have a um, an encampment of reenactors, a junior encampment. And the schedule is going to be packed for, again, another four days of... Um, not only music, but fun events for uh, family, children, adults of all ages. Fantastic. Can you tell our viewers how they can learn more about the Kent Lord House Museum? Okay. Uh, one, they can come and visit our location on 17 Cumberland Avenue in Plattsburgh. Uh, we're really accessible, and what's really nice is right opposite us is the Champlain Monument, and you have a million-dollar view across Plattsburgh Bay and of the Green Mountains. And you can also investigate us on the web, at 
kentthelordhouse.com. I'm uh, sorry, kentthelordhouse.org. And also visit us on Facebook. Well, that's wonderful. I want to thank you so much for coming in and telling us these great stories. It's fascinating. Okay. Always a pleasure, Judy. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. <laughs>